Okay, everyone, we're going to pick up with rural health, uh, where we stopped at in class um, and finish out this last section. Talking about um, just the second population sec that uh, I said we were going to cover. The first one was mental health, though the book does go over a lot of different types of um, special populations and their health needs. These are the two we're going to focus on for purposes of the class, but you know, do be aware that you are responsible for um, the information covered in the text. So with that, we'll go ahead um, and get started um, just talking about overall what does our rural population look like. Um, so if we compare it to other countries, the population of our, our rural population here in the United States, we have about 59 people who live in areas that are deemed rural. And uh, like I said, when we look at it, that's about the same population um, of the United Kingdom, of France, of um, Thailand. So we're talking about a significant number of population and a significant number of people that are considered rural. Um, so for example, you know, in urban areas of the United States for the last census in 2010, we had about 80% of the population was considered urban and then the remaining uh, almost 20% was considered rural. So let's see how that looks kind of laid out on a map of the United States. Now this is a county by county breakdown. Um, and here, here's us here in the Northeast Corridor, Tennessee. Um, there's my home county right there, Cock County. Um, so you can see, you know, 67% of my home county is, uh, is considered rural. So we, we have a lot of rural counties, um, more so out in the mid, Midwest, mid Northwest, um, where we're a little bit more spread out. We can see up here in Nebraska and Idaho, um, North and South Dakota, but we still do have a lot of rural areas here along this Appalachian train. Um, that we see, or Appalachian uh, region that we see here in the United States. So some a uh, question that I was going to present to you in class to kind of get your feedback on it, or just what are those factors that are having potential um, health care impacts and outcomes on our rural population. Um, so a couple that I want to kind of focus in on, um, geography, occupation, infrastructure, demographics, digital divide, and access to care. So we'll kind of look at these one by one and go a little bit more into detail on them. So when we look at geography, if you think about our particular area, the Appalachian region, so we have the Appalachian mountain chain. It makes travel really hard to, you know, get through these different mountain passes. Um, we have a lot of isolated communities that, you know, don't have a lot, a lot built up around them or they're very far away from more of our urban and metropolitan areas. Um, and so these smaller pockets that we see, particularly in our region here in Appalachia, um, we have smaller populations. And so overall travel is very hard um, and that's one factor when you think about rural health care that kind of impacts uh, health care and, and our outcomes. So when we look at occupation, um, you know, again, think back to what you see a lot around here. So we have a lot of people, you know, that travel for work, um, they farm, they're in hospitality, we have a lot of coal miners. Um, so we have a lot of pretty hazardous health conditions, you know, hazardous um, occupations in this area. We have a lot of people who travel for work. Um, so just another factor that kind of contribute or another contributing factor. Again, uh, infrastructure, I think we've touched on this before. Infrastructure in our particular area is very underdeveloped. We're a little bit, you know, people say we're a little bit behind the times in terms of infrastructure and technology. Uh, demographics is one that I really want to hit on um, because when we think about demographics, think about out migration. What I mean of that, what I mean by that is, how many of you really, you know, want to go back to where you grew up to work and raise a family and you know make a life there? You know, I'm from Little Cock County. Um, you know, while I love my home county, I don't particularly want to go back there raise my family work there simply because 
the jobs are not there for me. So when we talk about mm-hmm. out migration, um, you know, we have this talent in our communities and they, you know, leave for whatever reason for school or opportunities. They leave the communities and they never return. So we're left with a higher concentration of that more senior population in our rural communities as opposed to this younger generation or younger population. Digital divide um, feeds back into infrastructure. We're just not as tech savvy um, in this region or in the in the rural setting as compared to our more urbanized and metro settings. And then access to care, um, 80% um, of our rural counties are considered health professional shortage areas. So think back to when we talked about the workforce and we talked about health health professional shortage areas, 80% of those, those HPSA areas are considered rural. And so these different factors, geography, occupation, access, infrastructure, digital divide and demographics, all work to feed into why we have a couple issues um, with obtaining health care and why it really impacts our health care in the rural region and our health care outcomes. So we know that the demographic shift is happening in terms of we have a much older population here because of the out migration. So the question becomes, you know, how do we work to really start taking care of this population? And we have a couple safety nets that are built in in terms of, you know, primary care that we've talked about, FQHCs or com- and community health centers. We have a lot of rural health clinics. Um, and one entity that does play a, a large part are our local health departments. So we'll look into a little bit more of those. So talking about the rural safety net, when we look at hospital systems, the first thing we go to is kind of this infrastructure explosion, if you will, from the Hill-Burton Act in 1940 that was signed into law by President Truman, which just authorized funding to start building all this infrastructure for healthcare, with the thought being, hey, we're going to open up access by building all this great infrastructure. So then we have CMS come in and they really help to prop up our more rural hospitals. So they help to provide a lot of our ongoing revenue um, since the reimbursement structure here was mainly fee for service or primarily FFS. And then we have a couple special designations that were given to hospitals in terms of financing. So the government, you know, really comes in to help offset the cost by determining these different special designations which receive their, uh, you know, these hospitals with these designations are going to receive their reimbursement differently um, due to the different populations that they serve in this rural region. So we'll take a look at one of those hospitals which are called critical access hospitals or CAHs. Um, So we see critical access hospitals, I have this kind of highlighted here where we saw a lot of rural counties Critical access hospitals, we're going to see those a lot in rural communities, and they're really important to the care communities. So they're um, to be a critical access hospital, you have to be 25 beds or less. Um, and we mostly, again, you know, see these in the Midwest. They're not very common in Tennessee, and we have a couple up towards the top corner of the state um, and a couple out in North Carolina. But the primary reason region that we see these critical access hospitals is going to be out in our Midwest region. So again, critical access hospitals, these come out of the Balanced Budget Act in 1997. And again, we see these primarily in rural hospitals, 25 beds or less. Um, They have a small 24-7 emergency room and emergency room services. The whole point, you know, even if you look at their ALOS, their average length of stay being 96 hours or less, the whole point of the critical access hospital is to get you in and get you out quick. Um, So to be a critical access, you have to be 35 miles uh, primarily away from your nearest hospital, but the states really have control over that distance requirement. So some can go in and remove the distance requirement if they feel that that is necessary. 
So when we look at CMS, uh, Center for Medicare Medicaid Services, traditionally we would see CMS reimburse under cost. And we've said before in class, um, their traditional reimbursement is about 80 cents on the dollar. So if you go to a hospital and you have a Medicaid patient, you can anticipate for every dollar of services that you expend on that patient, you're going to get 80 cents in reimbursement. So you're taking about a 20% loss. But critical access hospitals are different. They get something called cost plus reimbursement, um, which is 100% reimbursement plus an additional 1%. And this is <clears throat> to help offset the cost um, incurred by these hospitals because of the patient population that they see. CMS also um, administers something called disproportionate share payments, uh, or these are also called DISH payments, D-S-H payments, uh, and these are used to help offset the treatment costs for these more vulnerable populations. So we said we see a lot of different, maybe more unique to us, health conditions um, that can cause treatment to be very costly, uh, especially if you're in a critical access hospital. Uh, so CMS offers out these DISH payments to help offset that cost. But we have a huge issue around critical access hospitals in terms of their closure and, um, you know, the services that they are providing to the population just kind of disappe disappearing. Um, so we have about 47 that have closed, um, and that's due in part to the radius requirements. Remember, I said they had to be 35 miles in radius from the nearest um, hospital. So as we see more infrastructure come in and be built up, that radius requirement is kind of going away. And unfortunately, we've seen more close since 2013 than in the previous 10 years. And we have about 41% of our critical access hospitals operating at a loss simply because, think back again to the population that they serve. So they have a lot of uninsured, they have high volumes that maybe they're not able to accommodate. Um, a lot of over-invested in capital, so they've expended their resources. And unfortunately, some are just poorly managed, um, which has caused the, kind of this operating loss. But they create this need of the patient population to travel these large distances to receive kind of these basic services that they need in terms of their health care. So critical access hospitals um, are really pertinent to opening up access for emergency medical services. And this is a really big deal uh, because studies have shown and research has shown that fatalities and accidents, we see a higher concentration of those in rural communities as compared to other communities simply because of our social and living behaviors in, in the rural setting. Um, you know, and think back to our occupational hazards that we have lots of coal mining, lots of farming, um, lots of travel. So we see, you know, a higher incidence rate of um, accidents and things like that. So what's kind of caused this perfect storm of financial challenges is we had the dish payments that were administered by CMS to help offset the cost of the patient population that critical access hospitals were seeing. But when the ACA was put into action and put into play, you know, we're opening up access, so we're expecting fewer uninsured people because of the individual mandate. Everybody has to go out and buy insurance now, so we're expecting fewer uninsured persons. Well, the whole reason for the DISH payment was to offset that uncompensated care from our uninsured patients, so the ACA put a 25% cut across the board for disproportionate share payments because we, we weren't expecting it. We, you know, we expected fewer patient or fewer uninsured patients. We didn't need as many or as much in the pot for dish payments. But then what happened is states, it was ruled that since Medicaid is a state ran and funded program, states did not have to fund or excuse me, did not have to expand their Medicaid programs. 
Well, this causes an issue because the thought when the dish payments were cut is that every state would expand their Medicaid services. So the Supreme Court came out about two to three years after the disproportionate share payment cut um, and said that states do not have to expand their Medicaid program. And so we started seeing this issue pop up, like I said, two to three years later, um, and states chose not to expand. And it really undermines the notion that we were working under the assumption of with disproportionate share payments is that people would have insurance. Well, now they don't. And particularly in rural communities, uncompensated care is still a huge issue because not only have we lost 25% in our payment on, on DISH, but now we have Medicaid that didn't expand. So now we've actually seen a rise in uninsured, um, which has kind of just created, like I said, this perfect storm um, in terms of why we see a lot of the critical access hospitals closing. So the economic recession that we started to see um, forced about 293 critical access hospital closures. So let's look how this really works to affect the economy. So typically the two largest employers in more rural communities are schools and hospitals. More often than not, if you live in a rural community, you're either going to work at the school or you're going to work at the hospital. So if we have a critical access hospital that closes in a rural community, this can really create a significant job loss for that community and for their population, which can domino effect into other sectors of a community's economy. So if we had 293 close, which we said we saw 293 facing foreclosure because of the recession, on average, what that's going to translate into is about 36,000 direct jobs and 50,000 community jobs for a total of about 10, almost $11 billion hit to local rural economies. So really just this perfect storm of issues came together to really put us in the situation we're in right now in terms of critical access hospitals. Um, community health centers, uh, F, or they're also called FQHCs, federally qualified health centers. Um, they are a non-for-profit. Uh, they're a 501c3, and they receive grant money uh, from the federal government, which means they, since they are receiving federal money, they have to see everybody regardless of their ability to pay. So they're kind of like a hospital that receives Medicare reimbursement. They have to receive to um, see or accept anyone through their center regardless of their ability to pay and they work more on a sliding scale fee. And so we actually have an FQHC here on campus in terms of the student health clinic as an FQHC. The next one we're going to talk about rural health clinics. Um, these can be for-profit or non-for-profit, and they don't really receive federal grant money, so they're not required to see everyone regardless of their ability to pay, um, and, and so they're not required to see uh, uninsured patients if they don't want to. They're not forced as part of their reimbursement. So the last one we're going to talk about, local health departments. Um, think back to when we were talking about the history of public health. We went over health departments through that. And, you know, early on, for health departments, their main focus and main concern was more environmental-based. So we saw a lot of sanitation issues, a lot of disease prevention or disease spreading issues. So really population-based in its earliest kind of formation. Um, in the, you know, 50s through 70s, we didn't really have infrastructure in our rural communities. So we had no FQHCs there we really had to rely on as a rural community our local health departments and so because of that local health departments were almost forced to be more engaged clinically which really worked to blur the lines between public health and medicine 
But then we had the IOM, um, you know, think back, we had the IOM come out, the Institute of Medicine come out and say that there was really a complete disarray among our health departments and that they need to get back to their population-based work that they used to do. So we saw, a lot of pop, uh, we saw a lot of health departments pull out of the clinical services game, go back more towards population-based. So it's kind of made this, you know, come full circle, if you will, in terms of our local health departments, but we'll take a look kind of at the breakdown. Um, so we have uh, the current landscape of our LHDs. A lot still do periodic screening diagnosis and treatment, uh, P PSD. We have about 50 percent, you know, family planning, 40 percent immunizations, um, periodic screenings, prenatal care, primary care, managed care, uh, is kind of what the current layout of health departments look like across our rural region. And some uh, <clears throat> recent trends within rural health care that we've seen. So we've seen a lot of integration between health care and public health. Um, and unfortunately, that's led to a lot of consolidation of local health, uh, public health departments simply because of funding. Um, and the ACA has kind of mandated that health systems overall need to focus more on population health. So we've seen hospitals in rural regions focusing a lot more on uh, population health and, and how they can help improve the health of the population because soon those health systems, their reimbursement is going to be tied not just to their patient population, but to the um, health outcomes of the population at all, regardless of whether they're a patient of that system or not. Um, so that's all I had in terms of rural health, guys. I know that was really quick and short and sweet and to the point. But again, you know, anytime you guys have any questions, if something I went over with rural health was not really that clear, you know, please stop by and see me. Um, looking back at the study guide, um, a couple of the questions that we didn't get to um, in class, but we were able to get to through this recorded lecture. Um, under the multiple choice key factors affecting rural communities with respect to healthcare outcomes. Let me just go back a couple slides. Um, so we're going to find the answer to that question right here, um, key factors uh, and what we talked about here in terms of access and geography, things like that. Um, again, looking at the study guide, factors that may under long, long answers, factors that make healthcare delivery more challenging. Refer to this slide again, be able to kind of put in your own words why these different factors make um, Healthcare delivery in these more rural communities very challenging. And then um, two key policies from the Affordable Care Act um, that created a challenge for rural hospitals. That's where we're going to refer to disproportionate share payments or dish payments. So refer to this slide, get some background on what disproportionate share payments are, current issue in regard to closures and then how disproportionate share payments and Medicaid non-expansion kind of created this perfect storm um, that created a lot of challenges for our critical access hospitals in this more rural setting. Uh, guys, I hope you have a, a great afternoon. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to stop by anytime. Shoot me an email, give me a call, um, and I'll be happy to go over anything with you. Um, and if not, we'll see you next time.